All right, it's good to see everybody in the class tonight, and welcome everybody on the, the YouTube who is viewing uh, all over the world. No telling who's watching this tonight, but we want you to enjoy it and learn, and most of all, to know, learn to know Jesus Christ and who Amen. he is Amen. about the scriptures. Now, we are studying dispensations and covenants in the Bible. Now, everybody has read these things, but a lot of people just didn't know what you called them. And you rightly divide the word. We normally divide it with the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's what everybody thinks. But if you get a little bit deeper into it, you can divide it into seven dispensations and eight covenants. Now, we've already discussed uh, the five dispensations. And we have uh, two more to discuss, and that's the two that we're going to discuss tonight. The, the dispensation number six and dispensation number seven. And uh, I love number six and love number seven uh, because number six is what we're in now. We are in the church age or the age of grace. And I always want to... Uh, go back to the chart here that we have on the wall. If we can, can you zoom in on this anymore, Mr. Mm -hmm. Producer? Sure. And uh, on our on our chart here, everything going up here points to the birth and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything in the Old Testament pointed to this very event, the most important event in history, is this section right here with the birth, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the ascension of Jesus Christ. Because this is God's master plan. Understanding God's master plan. When you understand it, you see the Bible in a whole different light. You have eternity past. Then you have the fall of man, which is the age of innocence. Then you have the flood, which uh, uh, came after... Man fell. Man fell and sinned. That brought in the age of conscience. Then you had the dispensation of the age of human government. That's with uh, Noah and goes on to the tower, uh, tower of Babel. Then you have the age of promise, which is with Abraham. God promised to bless the world through Abraham, and he did that because Jesus Christ came through Abraham. Also, the nation of Israel came through Abraham. And so this is the age of promise. God promised to Abraham that his descendants would be as the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky. And so uh, that's the age of promise. Then it goes on to the age of the law. The age of the law is with Moses, and uh, when God, when the nation of Israel was put together now, and they found themselves in the Egyptian bondage, and uh, then Moses led them out, and, and out in the wilderness at Mount Sinai, God gave Moses the law, and the law is God's perfect will. Now, in this law are, are uh, three uh, covenants, the, co the Mosaic Covenant, then is the Palestinian Covenant, which talks about the land and Israel being restored back to the land, and then you had the Davidic Covenant, which is David, and God told David and promised David there would always be your throne and there will always be a seed or an heir of David to sit on the throne. Well, these are the promises right here. Now, all of this moves up here to Jesus, the birth of Jesus Christ, God's master plan. And now, Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, and when Jesus died on the cross, then the next dispensation came in, and the next covenant came in, and that is the new covenant, which is the New Testament, and we're in the age of grace. The age of grace. And the age of grace just goes on. 
and the dispensation of the new covenant goes on, uh, but then we have this 1,000 year reign. And that right there is called the fullness of time. Ephesians 1.10, chapter 1, verse 10. The fullness of time when God puts everything together in Jesus Christ and he fulfills his master plan and new heaven and new earth and eternity future begins. When you study the Bible that way and look at it in that total picture, then you can understand the Bible. I preach differently now than I used to. When I have a sermon, I know it's from this section, or this dispensation. I know how God is dealing with people in the Old Testament. Why he did certain things there. Why he's doing now. Why is he giving us the age of grace? Because Jesus took everything, Jesus took every sin upon himself for you on the cross of Calvary. Amen. And, and <clears throat> everything back here pointed, all the animal sacrifices, the law, everything pointed to Jesus Christ. The tabernacle pointed to Jesus Christ. Man could not keep the law, and so God gave the tabernacle, which was the blood where the sacrifices were. And now Jesus, in these last days, God has spoken to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And so this now, when Jesus died on the cross, the New Testament began. Now, in the, in the Gospels, we all think the Gospels are the New Testament, which that's the way it's lined up in our Bible. But in the Gospels, when Jesus walked upon this earth, it was still the period of the law. The law lasted until Jesus died on the cross. That's where the law ended and grace began. So that's what we're going to look at tonight. And aren't you glad we're in the age of grace? Amen. That nobody could keep the law. We don't have to sacrifice animals. We don't have to depend upon our good works. Because now it's all through the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. And Jesus was telling all, telling uh, Nicodemus, he said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. So, so everything is through Jesus. No other name, no other name, no other name, but the name of Jesus and the authority of the name of Jesus. And so it all, even the book of Revelation, listen, God's master plan is, is so beautiful. And we study, everybody wants to study the book of Revelation. Well, Revelation is just the end of the plan. It's just the end of the plan. There's all, so much more in here to study. So as we look tonight, the final two uh, dispensations and the new, uh, new covenant, the personal reign of Christ. Let's look now at Matthew chapter 7. Verses 45 through 51. Matthew chapter 7, verses 45 through 51. Now here Jesus is dying on the cross. And, um, and I just want you to see what he said. Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 through 51. Okay? We're ready? Have you got it? Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbathani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Listen, boy, there's been a lot of questions. Why, why did Jesus cry that out? And, and, and the answer that's, that so many people, and, and what I believe, is at that moment, that moment. See, Jesus is God, and God is Jesus. Amen. But at, at that moment, Remember, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. At that moment, it seems the Father 
could not look upon sin. Amen. And Jesus took every sin that everybody or ever has committed or ever will commit Amen. upon mm -hmm. himself. And for the first time as a human being, Jesus realized what it was <coughs> to be sin. Amen. To be sin. And he cried out, God, where are you at? Why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? Oh, God. Everything, everything ugly that everybody's ever done came upon Jesus at that time. That's why in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed and, and his sweat was like blood. He said, and, and he said, Lord, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. If there's any other way to, to save mankind, let this cup pass from me. Because he, Jesus was a man, but yet in his heart, in his, in his spirit of God, he was God. But then Jesus says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine. And then in the book of Hebrews, I think it's chapter 12, it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And the shame of the cross. For the joy that was. What was the joy? The joy was that salvation was coming. And Jesus became the sacrifice for all mankind. Amen. And, and so we don't, we don't have to offer those animal sacrifices anymore. Now, uh, you know, you don't have to work for your salvation. There is no work that you can do. There's no money you can pay. There is nothing. You don't have to go knocking on doors. You know, salvation comes, John 3, 16. Everybody quote it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What else do you want me to do? What else can we do? That's the verse you ask everybody that believes in works, or that believes in baptism, that believes in uh, speaking in tongues. you got to speak in tongues to be saved, or that you have to go knocking on doors. Okay. What else do you do? What else can you do? When Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door, the first thing I ask them is John 3.16. Most of them can't quote it. But when I help them quote it, then we come to the end. I said, now what else do you want me to do? Uh, they're speechless. Speechless. <clears throat> Somebody comes and says, you've got to be baptized in order to be saved. I go back to John 3, 16. He said, now what do you want me to do? Well, you've got to be baptized. I said, oh, that's what it says. Not what it says. Somebody says, well, you've got to speak in tongues, prove you've got the Holy Spirit and, and that you're saved. Uh, John 3, 16. Nothing else. Nothing else. John 3, 16 is the pivotal point for the whole Bible. And so now it's, it's salvation through Jesus Christ. The new covenant, the new testament is everything is through Jesus Christ. Everything. Now, when Jesus cried that, let's read the rest of the scripture. Verse 47. Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, that man calls for Elijah. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on the reed and gave him the drink. The rest said, let be, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost or yielded up the spirit. In other words, the spirit that was in this his physical body left. Left. And that's the same thing with, with a Christian. When a Christian dies, the Bible says, James says, the body without the spirit is dead. Uh, Corinthians tells us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Lord. So, And the word everlasting life, everlasting means uninterrupted uninterrupted, nothing interrupts. And I was sharing this with a lady in the hospital the other day who's 
have, having a fear of death. They want to make sure we're salvation. And we talked about all of this. And, and, and I said, you know, she's afraid when her heart quits beating. I said, when your heart quits beating, if they can't revive you, I said, the angels of God are going to be in this room. Mm -hmm. And Jesus himself, and maybe your loved ones even, are going to be coming with you, with him, and they're going to escort you into the presence of the Father, Hallelujah. into heaven. Jesus says, "Where I am, there you may be also." And so that's that's for the believer, that's for us, because when Jesus died, he yielded up the spirit. Now the Bible says he went to uh, the, speak to those that had already died that were in, in paradise. Abraham's bosom, and that's a whole other topic, and so we can't get on that yet, but it's in the Bible. Uh, now, verse 51 is very important, right here. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks were split. Why is that so important? Because the in the in the temple, behind the veil in the whole in the, the the building there, the holy the holy place was here where the priest went, and then there was a veil, and the only the high priest went behind that veil once a year to offer blood on the mercy seat for the sins of all the people. Now. Only that high priest could go. He was the one, he was the mediator between man and God. But when Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the temple split from the top down. What does that mean? That means now the new covenant dispensation has started. Roger, that veil was not a veil like these curtains. It was a very thick veil. A thick yeah. veil, thick, Seven, and, yeah. yes. Seven, yeah. Yes, and, 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 and so now it simply means that you and I as believers can go into the presence of God. We, we don't need an earthly priest. You know, the Bible says, and we study Revelation, that we are now priests ourselves. We are kings. I don't use the term layman because you can't be a priest and a layman at the same time. See, there's no layman in the church of Jesus Christ. There's no layman. We're all priests. Everybody has the right to pray. Everybody has the right to read their Bible. Everybody has the right to witness. Everybody has the right to lead somebody else to Jesus. Everybody, Because we can go into the very presence of God through the name of Jesus Christ. Because the veil has been torn from top to bottom, and the blood of Jesus has been sprinkled there. Well, that's another story too. When we studied in Sunday school, about, or when we said I'm fulfilling all righteousness, and and Jesus fulfilled all righteousness. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna look closer at this right here. Now, verse um, verses 52 and 53 give us something that happened. After the resurrection of Jesus. Now, this is, it seems like it happened right then. It tells us that the, that the, uh, the grave of a lot of the saints were opened and their bodies came out. Resurrected bodies came out. And they walked the streets of Jerusalem. We don't hear much about that right there, do we? Mm -hmm. uh, see, but it but it happened. But it happened after the resurrection of Jesus, because Jesus was the first fruits yes. mm -hmm. of them that slept, and so then everything comes after after that. So those two verses make a note beside that. Those two verses happen after the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, now. I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, <coughs> and we'll go chapter 8 through chapter 10. Let's look at, um, we'll start with uh, verse 6, but actually we can, we can, you can go on up here because this is talking about the priestly work of Jesus now. 
You see, Jesus had to ascend to the right hand of the Father. He is now, he is now our high priest. Drop my glasses. He is now my our high priest. And uh, we are priests. See, in the Old Testament, there was a high priest, and then they had the other priest. But Jesus is the one that is in the presence of God for us and interceding for us. And as long as Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, we have an advocate, we have somebody interceding for us, we, uh, uh, we can go into the presence of the Lord because of this. All right, so in Hebrews chapter 8, the first five verses talk about, talk about that. But the verse I want to start with now is in verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the what? Mediator. Mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. So now we have the establishment of a better covenant, the best one, and it's the New Testament. It is the new covenant now, and so Jesus is the mediator. Now, I, I just don't understand what well, I do understand because I've studied it, but why the Catholic Church have a priest? You know, why do you still have to go to confession to an earthly priest? See, that's just not biblical doctrine. It's even in the Catholic Bible. It's not biblical doctrine. And so this is a man-made doctrine of control. But I'm not going to, I don't want to get into that. That's a, a cartoon. Somebody showed me, said the, the pastor's wife uh, was in the audience. And whenever the, whenever the preachers, the, her husband started chasing rabbits, she held up a rabbit, picture of a <laughs> rabbit, and she, he knew that he had to come back to his main topic because <laughs> it's, it's easy to get sidetracked on another, another subject if you're not careful. Verse 7 of Hebrews chapter 8, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Israel couldn't keep the law. It was impossible. They couldn't do it. Verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. <clears throat> now, what about this right here? You and I are not people of Israel or of Jews. But yet, we are, as we studied when we studied the Abrahamic covenant, you and I are children of Abraham by adoption. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. You've got to be born again spiritually. You, you are, when you become a Christian, you are placed into the body of Christ, and you become part of Abraham's family. We are adopted in to the body of Christ and to, to Abraham's family. And uh, so that's why we talked about that song, hey, Father Abraham and many sons, many sons, and I'm one of them, and so are you. So the, the book of Romans tells us this, and, and all the other scriptures, that when we become a Christians, we are brought into the family of God, and we're brought into the family of Father Abraham, who had many sons. That's why Jesus told him, he said, hey, hey, if you can number the stars in the sky, you're going to be able to number your kids. If you can number the sands on the seashore, you'll be able to number your kids. Not just was Israel, but it was all the believers that were going to be saved through Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, now, uh, and so when we get saved, verse 10, God, 
God takes his law now and writes the law in our heart. See, as a Christian, have you ever been convicted when you do something wrong? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, all right. That's because the Holy Spirit has that law in your heart and you know it's wrong. There's, there's a conviction there. And, and so it's written in our heart. We don't need to... See, we got the Ten Commandments hanging on the wall here. Nobody's ever kept those Ten Commandments. Nobody. But those things are written in our heart. And when we do sin, the Holy Spirit says, Uh-oh, hey, listen, that's wrong. You should have said that. You should have done that. You should have acted that way. You should have thought... That's the Holy Spirit. And thank the Lord for the Holy Spirit. That's mm -hmm. what also what conviction is. When a lost person comes under the sound of the gospel and the Holy Spirit starts working on him, working on his heart, and he starts being convicted of how sinful he is. And a lot of people, that's how we got saved because we were brought under conviction of, of our sin and who we were. How how unrighteous we are in the presence of God. And we cannot go into the presence of God as unrighteous people. And so Jesus became righteousness, and so we have the right to go into the presence of God, not by our own righteousness, but by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's why we can go into the presence of God. All right, now, and so we have the Holy Spirit living in us now, and it's even going to get better during the tribulation and during the uh, thousand-year millennial reign. Um, verse 13, in that he said, a new covenant he has made, the first old, now that which decays and groweth old, is ready to vanish away. Now, in chapter 9, it, it gives you a history of, of the high priest in Israel and what he did and how his service was into the tabernacle. He went in once a year. Jesus has gone into the presence of the Father for eternity. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek, an eternal priesthood. All right, now, look at verse chapter 9, verse 11. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, and that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by his own blood he's entered in once into the holy of place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? How much better the blood of Christ is than the blood of bulls and goats? Then verse 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, the New Covenant, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that were under the First Testament, they who are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now look, here's the word. Here's the, here's the, here's the two verses. And you need to underline these two verses, 16 and 17. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator lives. So uh, Jesus had to die in order for the New Testament to come in. And so when Jesus died on the cross, the, the, the curtain was torn from top to bottom, all the way down, the New Testament began. The age of grace. The church age. Age of grace. That's what we're in now. That's what we're in now. Jesus, boy, isn't this good? See, the, the people in the, in the, down here, they didn't, they didn't know this. They didn't know 
know this. They couldn't look to the cross because it hadn't happened yet. So now we, we live in the time of the cross, the age of grace in the church. This is a time period that the nation of Israel did not see. Paul says this time period was a mystery to all the prophets in the Old Testament. Jesus says, I will build my church. And that's what he's doing right through here until the rapture of the church when Jesus takes the church out of this world. So we're in the age of grace. Now let me, let's just read here. Uh, let's see, let me, I got one more, one more verse I need to read. Well, chapter 10 is, is so good, talking about the, the blood of Jesus and all, but Jesus was at the seed of David through Mary. Joseph's line came through Solomon, who ruled the throne, but Mary's line came through Nathan, the son of David. This made Jesus legal on both accounts. He was heir to the throne and heir as the seed of David. This is also why the virgin birth had to be. Jesus had to have been born of a virgin. With God the Father. Alright? The new covenant rests upon the sacrifice of Christ himself. It secures the eternal blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. The promise. It began when Jesus died upon the cross. Everything now is through Jesus Christ. Everything is through Jesus Christ. So that is the, the dispensation 6. But then there's one more to come, and there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of questions on the seventh one. But I want you to look now in Ephesians chapter one, verse ten. Ephesians chapter one, verse ten. Paul is writing in this verse, and he says, "In the fullness." Of the dispensation of time. The fullness of time. That means when everything is settled, everything has happened, the church has been raptured, and now the tribulation period begins. The church is taken out. The tribulation period begins, which is a, another study that we study in the uh, book of Revelation. But, the age of grace is still in the tribulation period because people are still being saved, but the, they're having to endure to the end. But then when Jesus comes back and puts his foot on the Mount of Olives and destroys the Antichrist and the armies of the world, and he sets up the thousand-year millennial reign. Now, the thousand-year millennial reign, let's look at... Uh, uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. And um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because we did when we studied the book of uh, Revelation. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, we want you to read all of this. Verses 4 through 6. Uh, this thousand years of peace is very important. This is the age of the kingdom, personal reign of Jesus Christ, the fullness of time. Okay? This is when Jesus is putting it all together. Putting it all together. Chapter 20 of Revelation. And I saw thrones, verse 4. I saw thrones, and they set upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. And for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the, and for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither hath received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. Now, I want you to notice this. The church is raptured, but during this seven year period, there are people who turn to Jesus Christ, and they are killed. They are martyred for Jesus. 
And when Jesus comes back, they are resurrected. And they are sitting on thrones with the church, with us. That's what the scripture says. And they lived and reigned with Christ, what? A thousand years. A thousand years. So the thousand years has to happen. There's a lot of preachers that don't preach this and don't believe this. It has to happen for God to fulfill his whole plan. And then the rest of the dead didn't live again until the thousand years were finished. So what's going on in that thousand year uh, period? It says, blessed and holy, verse 6, that he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death has no power, but they shall be what? Priests Priest of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him, what? Thousand years. thousand years. There's a reason for that thousand years. It is during that thousand years that God will fulfill all of his promises, everything. That's the importance of that thousand years. All right, now, I want you to look at... Uh, well, I've, I've showed you the scripture, Revelation 1, Revelation 4, Revelation 5, tells us that we are priests and kings, okay? Now, you take this right here. Jesus, during that thousand years, will sit on the throne of David. We sing at Christmas time. And we talk, we sing, the, we read Isaiah, the judgment, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Jesus has never had a government. Herod thought he was going to take over the government then, but he, that's not what he came for. He came down the cross as a sacrifice. So during that thousand years, the throne of David will be set up, and Jesus, heir to the throne, will sit up on that throne Amen. for that thousand years. All right? Now, Israel will live in the complete land that was promised to Abraham. See, over here, when, when in the book of Genesis, I think it's Genesis 15, when, when God shows Abraham the land, it goes from the Nile River all the way to the Euphrates River, Euphrates River separates Iran and Iraq. The Nile River is over in Egypt. Israel's never had that land. They got that little old beady spot that you can barely see on the map. And all the nations are fighting for it. That little beady spot. But during the thousand year reign, they will inhabit all the land that was promised to Abraham during that thousand years. Those, well, boy, we're getting into Revelation again. But those people, Matthew 25, there are, there, are, there are Jews or people of Israel who trust Jesus Christ during the tribulation period. And they don't get killed. There are people, according to Matthew 25, who will help Israel during that time period escape and help them to take, take care of they are called they are the, called the sheep nations they will be ushered in physically into that thousand year millennial reign and they will be living with Israel in physical bodies during that 1000 years of peace you have to go to the book of Isaiah and talk about that but you and I will be in our glorified bodies sitting on thrones with Jesus. Okay? Now, a thousand years, there's going to be a lot of people born during that time period. Man, we can't, we, we say, I just don't believe it. Well, listen, what, what do you think about over here if they were to, if they were to, somebody tell them about, hey, what's going on in the church age? They say, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. But now here we are in it. And so this thousand years, this tribulation is going to happen this thousand years is going to happen. All right, and uh, I'm, I'm, we're nearly through because I you can't go into great detail on this. You have to watch my study on Revelation on the book of YouTube if you want to if you want to uh, learn it, uh, uh, know more about it. The curse is lifted during that time period. 
the curse is lifted. There'll be no more, uh, you know, the, the, the land, no more curse in it that was placed on it with, with Adam. Uh, Satan, bound, Satan is bound a thousand years. Church and tribulation saints will rule and reign on thrones with Jesus. That is the dispensation. Of course, when that dispensation is over with, or when that thousand years is over, you have the great white throne judgment, and then you have the new heaven and the new earth, and then eternity future. That's the plan of God. So now, in closing, Jesus, the first covenant, Jesus is the second Adam, the Bible says. The second covenant, Jesus is the seed of the woman. The Edenic, Edenic covenant, where the seed, to destroy the serpent, would come through the seed of the woman. In the Noah covenant, Jesus is the son of Shem. In the Abrahamic covenant, Jesus is the promise. In the Mosaic covenant, Jesus lived the sinless life of the law. The Palestinian covenant, Jesus lived as an obedient Jew in the land. The Davidic covenant, Jesus is the seed and heir to the throne. And in the new covenant, Jesus is the supreme sacrifice. So everything is through Jesus. Now, I want to end it in this one thing. Come Turn back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're, we're going to be ending this study. Verse 24. Then comes the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he has put down all rule and all authority and all power. For Jesus must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And at the end of the thousand years, Satan is cast into the lake of fire. All followers of Satan cast into the lake of fire. The last enemy shall be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. For when he has put all things under him, it is manifest that he is accepted. In other words, God is not under Jesus. But in verse 28, And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. In other words, after this thousand years and, and all, Jesus will... Has delivered, he's defeated death. He's defeated the devil. All him, everything, everything now is back to the way it was intended to be at the beginning. Amen. And Jesus turns to the Father and says, Father, here it is. And now I'm subject to you. Because remember, God is Father, Son, and and Holy Spirit, and Jesus and all, now it all comes back to God. See? And then eternity future begins, and you and I will be living in the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem and glorified bodies forever. Amen. 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 Remember, no Satan, no sin, no sickness, no death. That's the awesome plan of God. And once you study the Bible in this light, you can understand it. You can understand it. You can understand why certain parts of the Bible this way, why certain parts of the Bible are this way. But it all comes down to the end. The most important thing is to make sure that you're saved. Amen. How can you know you're saved? But you do what the Bible says. And you do what the Holy Spirit is convicted to say. Jesus Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Save my soul. I believe that you are the Son of God. And God has raised you from the dead. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Now, find you a Bible-believing church. Talk to the pastor. 
confess Jesus, say you you've confessed Jesus, and follow the Lord in believers' baptism, and then start studying your Bible and growing in Jesus. So I want to thank you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this study. And Father, take it, and your word will not return void. And whoever hears this, may they be blessed. May they be touched and led by the Holy Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen.